Okay, hello and welcome to this evening's uh, webinar. My name is Khalif Smith. I am the pastor at First United Methodist Church of Mesa and the chairperson for the Desert Southwest Annual Conference Race Coalition. If you'll remember, race uh, in our coalition stands for reflection, action, courageous dialogue, and engagement. And tonight we are proud to welcome the Reverend Dr. Miguel de la Torres, uh, author, um, professor, uh, knowledge, uh, th knowledgeable theologian, and uh, social justice activist. And we look forward to having a, a, a great discussion uh, with him this evening. Kimberly will give you a more um, detailed description of our introduction for him, but I just wanted to say hello and welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. We want to let you know that um, next month we have another uh, webinar which is coming up uh, along with a, a viewing of a documentary called The Long Shadow uh, and then we will have a discussion with Fa Francis Causey um, in next month. So keep your eyes peeled uh, for that information which will be forthcoming as well. Tonight on the panel we have the Reverend Kimberly Scott who is the pastor at Crossroads United Methodist Church in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We have the Reverend Javier Alvarez, who is the pastor at Grace United Methodist Church in Mesa, Arizona. We have Pastor Gina Pollard, who is the pastor at City Square United Methodist Church. Is it a church mm -hmm. or fellowship? Yeah. Fellowship uh, church, yeah, City Square Church. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, City Square Church uh, down in Phoenix as well. And of course, uh, the Reverend Dr. Miguel de la Torres. So we, um, I, I'll turn it over to Kimberly at this time. And we, again, just welcome you and thank you for being with us tonight. Amen. Thank you, Kali. Uh, my name is Reverend Kimberly Scott. As Kali told you, I'm the past senior pastor at Crossroads UMC here in Phoenix, Arizona. In just a moment, I'll have the privilege of being able to introduce to you Reverend Dr. Miguel de la Torre from the Isla School of Theology. Um, I first learned about Dr. De, De La Torre when I was attending um, the Isle of School of Theology, and I had a chance to read his book, Out of the Shadows and Into the Light. Um, that book was very foundational for me as I was uh, reconciling my faith and my sexuality and um, trying to answer a call to ministry. Um, so mm -hmm. I thank you for that, for that book, Miguel De La Torre. Um, so anyway, I first learned about uh, the book, his book, Reading the Bible from the Margins, this summer, when, when my congregation was asking for resources. How do we engage the topic of race and religion and the Bible? Um, what are some things that we can, um, that we can, some readings that we can engage to talk about power and privilege and race? And so I found this book and it was just very engaging. Um, and so thus far in the Desert Southwest Conference, we have four churches that have either are in, doing a book study right now on the book, Reading the Bible from the Margins, or have um, read the done a big study on reading the Bible from the margins, and that is City Square Fellowship, Faith UMC, Trinity UMC, and Crossroads UMC. And we've had some very lively and interesting discussions and conversations, <laughs> um, but we are all on the path to learning and growing into perfection, and Miguel, you are helping us to do that. Thank you, Dr. De La Torre. So the focus of Dr. De La Torre's um, academic pursuits is social ethics within contemporary U.S. thought, specifically how religion affects race, class, and gender oppression. Since obtaining his doctoral degree in 1999, he has authored over 100 articles and published 36 books, five of which have, have won national awards. He presently serves as a professor of social ethics and Latinx studies at the Isla School of Theology, Go Isla. He's also a Fulbright scholar and he has taught in Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, and Germany. And there's so much more that I can say about Miguel de la Torre that only gives you a brief glimpse of who he is and of all the things that he has done. But we wanna get into discussing um, this book. So um, Dr. de la Torre, can we just start with, um, in your preface, you say that um, this book was forged in the classroom. Um, can you take us through that process of, of what led to the writing of the book, Reading the Bible from the Margins? Uh, of course. Um, I obtained my doctorate in um, 1999, and I was um, I received the professorship um, to teach in a um, 
Michigan, a West Michigan college. Um, it was a very conservative college. Um, and and um, they, they, one of the reasons they hired me, they were hoping I would bring in some of these views. So I decided to teach a class called Reading the Bible from the Margins um, to mainly uh, white, um, like 99.9% .9 white, um, like 90% conservative um, freshman college students. And when I finished the class, I knew that they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> that no matter how much I tried to do the class, it just went, you know, it, it, most of it just went over the head, not because they couldn't understand it, but because they couldn't relate to it. So I decided to take all my class notes and turn it into a book. In this way, they could go slowly through the book and, and, and wrestle with the issues rather than just getting angry at me during the class for raising the issues. Um, and, and unbeknownst to me at the time, when, I, when the book got published, it, it, it became the most popular book I've, I've ever written. I mean, I've, 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 you said 36 books, I'm up to 41 now. But of all my books, this is the book that literally continues to be a bestseller, um, which I find fascinating because a lot of the things in the book that I wrote about, I've moved beyond that. I see it now as so elementary that I don't really deal with it anymore. <laughs> and, and, my, and my thinking on biblical reading is at a different locale than it was back then. But I think the book is still good because it speaks to people where they are. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's geared to an audience that's a little more conservative in their understanding of the biblical text. And I think I was able to do that because I've come from a very, I came from a biblically conservative background, being a good old Southern Baptist. So I know the language and it was just being able to, to, to move the conversation forward. So that's, the, that's the, the genesis of that particular book. Okay. Awesome. And then one last question. I'm gonna pass the microphone over to, to Gina. Um, today you were on, earlier today, you and Dr. Trace, Tracy West were on the um, General Conference, well, GCOR's uh, race panel um, mm -hmm. and focused on intersectionality and how it functions systemically in the church. Mm -hmm. um, GCOR's overall goal right now is to dismantle racism in the United Methodist Church. Um, how do you think an intentional focus on reading the Bible from the margins can play into dismantling systems of oppression and racism in the church? That's a very complex question. So let me begin to see if I could um, deal with it. But, but let me also begin to say that I'm not a Methodist. Yes. So I'm an outsider and I don't want to speak as a Methodist or for Methodist. That would be, you know, so I want to make sure I, we understand my social location in this. I think one of the major problems facing the church, whether it be Methodist or any other church and in the United States, mm -hmm. is that it is reading a white Bible. And, and what I mean by that is that the way we read the Bible says more about our culture than it does about anything that the Bible actually says. Yes. So mm. basically, when we read the Bible, we bring our entire culture into that reading. And if our culture is racist, we then read racism in the Bible. If our culture is homophobic, we read homophobia into the Bible. So we read, you have a culture of sex as we read sex into the Bible. So, so, so we bring into the Bible the, the trappings of our very culture. Because this is a very white supremacist culture, we bring that into the biblical text. So to try to use the biblical text the way it has always been interpreted by this, by this culture um, makes it difficult, if not impossible, to use the Bible as any tool to dismantle racism. So we literally need to take our white Bibles and burn them because they are beyond redemption. The only way we can read the Bible is through black, law, uh, black eyes, Latinx mm. eyes, Asian eyes, uh, a queer eye for the straight Bible reader. We, <laughs> we need to read the biblical text through the eyes of the marginalized. So, so even though I wasn't this radical when I first wrote the book, there was still something there when I said, we need to read the, uh, read the Bible from the margins. Because I believe that the margins have 
a clearer understanding of whatever truth might be. Not because they're smarter or holier, but you know, um, channeling W.E.B. Du Bois, they have that double consciousness, consciousness. Mm -hmm. that allows them to understand how the dominant oppressive culture reads the Bible and how their own community reads the Bible. Thank you. Go ahead, Gina. Here we go. It's a very interesting thing having um, completed it. And, and I love the way that you take us through the view of, of a different Jesus too. It's not just the Bible. It is reading, you know, understanding Jesus as a black person, as a gay person, and um, all of those. Um, so the question is in Christian education, as we are um, hopefully informing people and um, as to how to read the Bible, what does um, intersectionality and reading from the margins look like in discipleship? I would say that in discipleship, um, if we want to have people to read the text from the margins, then we have to provide the authors from the margins. Mm. In, in other words, to try to under, try to read the Bible, trying to figure out what, you know, for example, when I wrote the section on, on, on the Black Jesus, mm -hmm. I have absolutely no idea what a Black Jesus is. I don't have the cultural tools or knowledge or experience to even right. imagine what a Black Jesus is. I needed Black biblical scholars to literally walk me through that so that I could at least begin to understand, but not yet fully knowing, as if I'm looking through a dark mirror. Mm -hmm. So basically, I have to humble myself and learn from my African-American siblings, my Asian siblings, my mm -hmm. queer siblings, my, 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 you know, my, my, my siblings and other cul-de-sacs. Yeah, about how they read the biblical text so that I could learn from them. That takes a lot of work. And, and here's the problem I think we have with discipleship. Those of us who get PhDs go to a university and we have to be fluent in white Eurocentric philosophy and mm -hmm. theology and biblical stuff. We, we, we have to, be, you know, we have to know it inside and out. None of my white PhD colleagues ever had to read anything about the Latinx religious experience. And yet they're considered educated and I'm considered an outsider. Yeah. So, so, so in a way, any type of discipleship has to mean learning from those other groups that we don't know about. And this is not just that white people aren't, aren't exactly reading the works of, my, of minoritized scholars, we have to be very honest and within our own minoritized cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. we seldom read the works of other minoritized right. groups. Mm -hmm. um, African-Americans are not reading Latinx folks. Yeah. Latinx folks are not reading Asian-American folks and, and, and it goes on and on. So we need to learn. I mean, if, if, we, if we expect our white colleagues to read our works, mm -hmm. we've got to read our, each other's own work. And, and I think when I wrote that particular book, it was one of the first books at the time that really brought all these voices together. Yeah. Uh, because up to that time, you had, you know, a black um, a, a black biblical reading and a Latinx how Latinx read the Bibles and mm -hmm. how it, you know, and I was trying to bring all these um, different um, themes together um, mm -hmm. because I really believe in the intersectionality of all this um, even back then when intersectionality was yet a buzzword. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. And I, I appreciate you putting this together because I think that the book is really a great primer for mm -hmm. people who are just now understanding concepts like social location um, and trying to understand that the way that they read the Bible, because there's a certain amount of hubris that we all have, that our interpretation is always the right one. And I don't need to understand it. Trying to have this conversation with my mother about why this book needed to happen was like, she's 88 years old and she's like, no, I just read the Bible and it tells me. So trying to understand lenses. So then my next question is, um, as we talk about discipleship, what does the book mean for 
um, for, I, I wanna say missions, but it's more than missions. It's more about outreach. So I'm a chaplain with the homeless um, population, the folks without homes downtown. Um, and so what, what is your desire that that would mean for that organization that I'm affiliated with? Um, before I answer that question, I want to go back to something you said earlier about that it's a good primer. And, and, and I think that's a good description. I hope that this book is nothing but an introduction. Yes, um, absolutely. That, that would lead people to read the works of others. Yes. Um, and and that's, what I, that's how I envision it when it was written. Um, but, but going back to your question, when you say missions and outreach, and you're talking to a Southern Baptist, Mm -hmm. What that means to me is how do I get you to believe what I believe? Oh, okay. um, it, it, you know, so, so I have a bit of baggage that comes mm -hmm. with that word because it, you know, it has always meant converting the other to my way of thinking. Right. Which now, is why your book gets used in missions classes all yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. um, so, so, so we need to understand that the whole purpose of mission is, is, is for us to be converted on how other people think. Um, yes. it, it reverses it. Um, I don't, you know, it, there's a certain hubris to think that I have the answers and therefore could convert people to my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I am wiser when I realize I don't know anything ah, and I'm willing to learn mm -hmm. from communities right. that um, have been um, historically oppressed. Um, and, 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 and that is what challenges me. I mean, to, to read the works of, for example, Tink Tinker, who mm -hmm. rejects Christianity altogether um, and, and, and says no to Jesus, mm -hmm. challenges me to the root of my very being because I have to wrestle with that also. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and not come up with excuses or try to dismiss him but it truly forces me to wrestle with my faith. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we are truly faithful when we are wrestling, wrestling with, with and, and, and we truly believe when we have so much doubt. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the contradiction, yeah. I think, of the so Christian gross. experience. Because we're taught that doubt is bad. Yeah, yeah, we're taught doubt, you know, you, yeah. you, we have the answers and, and, and how can we doubt that? Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, if anything, I hope the book is, is showing that, you know, we don't have the answers. We barely even know the questions. Yes. And we're trying to, 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 to wrap our mind mm -hmm. around ideas and concepts that are beyond our, comp our comprehension. Right. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Uh, the you air. To... Oh, sorry. Kim. I was going to say, do we want to go to some of our questions that are in our chat box and then go to Javier and Felipe? Would yeah. that be okay? Sure. Just so I'll, we can make sure that we're attending to our folks absolutely. that are. You have a couple that are very similar, so I'll just kind of group those together. Yeah. Um, they're asking about the, the scripture in terms of, is there a Bible that is not a white Bible, right? That is written from the margins that, that we could begin to... Um, to read or or, uh, or or come together on? Is there a translation that you may have, you know, encountered that that you feel is is coming from the margins or marginalized voices? No, there isn't, because <laughs> that was it's, easy. Written in, it's written in English, written. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and because it's written in English, it's using English words that that each word contains a certain. Um, a certain uh, signifying value to that word. So, so, so I'll give you an example. When you read in your Bible um, that the prayer of a, uh, of a righteous man availeth much, I'm using the King James here, so for, forgive the non-inclusion mm -hmm. here. But when you, read, when you read the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and I read that in Spanish, it's la oración del hombre justo, is the band of justice. Yes whose prayers availeth much. Mm -hmm. But just reading it in Spanish as opposed to English gives me a totally different translation because I could be righteousness in and of by myself without any community. That's the hyper-individualism of English that comes out in the very reading of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But Spanish, which is a more communal society, 
Um, I can never be just away from community. The, the, to, be, to do justice requires a community. So that's just one small example of how we can never read the Bible. You know, there's not a Bible or translation that we could read that is more liberative. Um, the only way to get that, um, quite frankly, is to be in conversation with groups that are outside of your group. So when you do talk to someone who does read the Bible in Spanish, um, you can get insights that you'll never see when reading it in English. When, when I was studying for my French exam, um, you know, for my PhD, one of the ways I studied it that I read the Bible in French because I already knew the stories. So it helped me in learning the language a lot easier. And as I was reading it in French, there were things there that I never saw before because it was a different language. The same when I read the Bible in Hebrew or in Greek, you know, words signify a worldview. So to read it in any language is to read the, 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 the worldview into that text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would yeah. agree with that. You know, as yeah. we talk about biblical hermeneutics and we go back to even Old Testament, right? Yep. And those early translations of the Elohim God or the... Mm -hmm. The Yahweh God and how that ended up getting translated into other words, the big G God of, of Europe and, and this idea of already kind of whitewashing, if you will, uh, scripture from the very early translations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so another quick, a little quick example is the word deacon, which mm -hmm. comes from the Greek deaconess, which in the Bible, it refers, you know, um, you know, there, there's some examples in Romans about women deaconess, but when we, you know, we didn't want to call them deacon because women can't be in ministry, can't serve in ministry, so we say we change it to server, which is the actual translation, but in Acts, we keep the word deacon when referring to men. Mm -hmm. So when the same word is used for men in English, it's deacon, when it's used for women, it's server. Wow. So, you know, you, you have this kind of, you know, so, so, so to, to, to find a, you know, a, a Bible that doesn't have culture's uh, biases imposed on it is almost impossible unless we begin to, to really just read it in different languages and, 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 and compare and contrast them. Wonderful, thank you. Um, one other question that came up from our, our chat so far has been, Dr. De La Torre, shouldn't the, the black Jesus, the Asian Jesus, the gay Jesus, the white Jesus, shouldn't they all be the same? I don't want to say they should be. I think every community has a right to see the divinity within their own cultural symbols. I mean, right now, the white Jesus has ruled for the last, what, 2,000 years? Um, and that's okay. If I'm right, you know, if I'm a white European, then the white Jesus is fantastic for me. But to have divinity in my own image and, and mm. let's face it, we all create mm. God in our own image. Right. Mm. Um, so to see divinity through the symbols of my own culture makes mm. that divinity one with us. Mm. You know, um, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, an Asian Jesus doesn't do it for me. Now, I could learn from an Asian Jesus when, you know, I'm in community with my Asian siblings. But if I'm going to worship, it's going to be in Spanish. Sing coritos. You know, seeing a Jesus that looks like me. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's wrong when I take my Jesus and make it um, objective for everyone else. When I take my subjective Jesus and make that Jesus objective for everyone else. And worse, I enforce that Jesus as the only true Jesus for everyone else. Mm. Colonization. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. De La Torre. Um, I, I like when uh, I like uh, the uh, the concept of uh, that you share about Han or Han. I don't know how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. On page twenty six, uh, which is the you know the disenfranchised, those who suffer un unbearable justice, the helpless. Um, that sorrow, that revenge that they feel on their gut. And I wonder, you know, with, 
with Black Lives Matter and you know all the all these past months, you know what happened and how certain media and you know government officials have painted at times a broad uh, brush and have you know condemned uh, uh, the you know the looters and and all that and so, but I wonder if if some of those who are looting are, are those who have the Han, are those who are suffering as well. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps, uh, you know, um, not, not justifying it myself, but if, if this is a way of, of um, taking out that, that Han that they feel, of course, you, you mentioned the Good Samaritan in, in the book, but how, how do we, because I, I think in church circles, this happens too. It's just a broad brush and, 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 and the condemnation. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so how, how do we, with our church people, how, how do we talk with them about that? Because they're so, sometimes they're so close to, to that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting that the whole concept of Han from the Asian American community, I think is so, is so wise. Because even when I wrote that back then, I didn't truly understand it mm. until more now. As, we, as we're discovering now, uh, one of the reasons why African-American babies who have the same prenatal care as white babies still are underweight is because the trauma of the parents and the grandparents and the great-grandparents of being <laughs> literally changing the DNA and impacting the very health of this newborn baby, even though they got the same medical treatment as a white child, as a white mother, uh, the same prenatal care. So, so I really see this Han. Back then, I just thought it was this emotional gut. Now I'm beginning to realize it radically changes your very DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, the suffering of my ancestors um, is being manifested in my body in ways that I don't even yet understand. And I don't think science has gotten there yet. So I want to begin there with Han. I, 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 I want to lift that up as, as a more complex issue than I understood when I first wrote that book. Mm -hmm. The second thing I want to mention, because you mentioned the looters during the Black Lives Matter. And I think we need to also be very cognizant that many of these looters are really um, the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys and these white supremacists and the, and, and, and on one side and anarchists on the other side who are basically co-opting yes. the Black Lives Movement in order to do violence for their own ends of creating a waste war and, 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 and violence. Um, and again, we should be surprised that again, outside groups are co-opting a nonviolent movement. Mm -hmm. Now, if there are a few people in a, in a predominantly peaceful movement that might loot, um, I, 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 I don't wanna say Han, I wanna say, why are we looking at those few people as an excuse to go ahead and brush stroke the entire Black Lives Movement? Mm -hmm. But saying all that, the way I see Han operating more today is as myself once being an undocumented immigrant. When I work with immigration issues, it touches me to a point that I can't, it's a pain that I cannot handle. Um, it, it's a pain that, that literally wears me down mm -hmm. because I understand that pain because yes. I've lived it in yes. the shadows of this government. Um, and I think that's what Han is. And in that pain, my children are going to go ahead and, and, and also suffer by it, not even knowing what it is or where it comes from. Mm. Um, and you're right, generation after generation after generation, there might come a point where you may have a breaking point. I don't see in the Black Lives Movement, but I do see, you know, I, I, I can imagine when, when, when a group may say enough of this, we're going to now become violent. Mm -hmm. 
My favorite quote from Cesar Chavez is, I'm not a nonviolent person. I'm a violent person trying to be nonviolent. <laughs> um, and, and, I'm, and I am trying to be nonviolent. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but at one point, you know, will I not be able to maintain that position? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I don't know. And I hope I never get to that point. Mm-hmm. But if this country continues on the path it is now, that Han may find new ways of expressing itself. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Yes. Ricardo, we are in the United Methodist Church always about developing new leaders, right? I mean, part of that example is the fact that we have you here tonight and we so appreciate the words that you are uh, expressing this evening. Some of the other questions are around the, the development of leaders. How do we uh, develop pastors, reverends, you know, laity, church leaders to, um, to express their true authentic voice, right? When we are steeped in a Eurocentric culture education system, right? And um, not only that, but once, and, and I'm kind of melding a couple of questions here together, but once the leaders do begin to step into those, those spaces and begin to read uh, the text from the margins, how, do, how does a church support that pastor in, in kind of bringing or fleshing out more of um, the, the marginalized voices? How, how does that, how do we go about doing some work like that? So, so there's a lot of different questions there. So I'm going to try to tease them out a little bit. Uh, first of all, the question of how do we um, develop leaders? Um, and I think the answer, the, the answer is the leaders are already there. You don't have to develop them, they exist. The problem is we have yet to really ask the question that should be asked, how do we change so that these leaders can work with us? Mm. That's oh, really yes. the question we should be yeah. asking. Yeah. Because we're not willing to change. I mean, you know, as long as we sing our 300 year old German hymns, you know, that's okay. You know, we're not willing to learn a new language. We're not willing, you know, I'm, I'm, Taco Tuesday doesn't cut it anymore. We really have to start thinking about how does the church radically change it? Because I'll be perfectly honest with you, why would I want to go to your church? I mean, if your church does, if your church basically supports the socio- cultural and political systems that are causing my people to be to, to be oppressed why the hell do I want to belong to that church and I'm being quite honest here I want nothing to do with that church and in fact the sooner that church you know dies let the dead bury the dead we'll be better off mm. and if the church doesn't begin to change it's better off dead, you know, and, 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 and I'm saying this as a seminary professor who needs churches so I can keep my job, but more <laughs> important than my job is the spirituality yeah. of a people. And I think, what, what, I think what's going on right now is we're trying to figure out how do we get people of color to be part of our church without us having to change, change. or give up any of our power. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. And as long as we're trying to play that math game, we're going to fail because I think most people of color see through that right away. So really, I think what the church leadership needs to do is sit down and say, how do we change? How do we give ourselves away? How do we do church differently? How do we read the Bible differently? Um, and, And not just in the building once a week, but outside the building, you know, I can't go to a church where I'm sitting across the, uh, uh, the pew from the cop who stopped me because I was driving while under the influence of being Latino. <laughs> I, I can't go to a church where the couple in front of me who just gave me the hand, you know, the, the hand in friendship is also voting to make sure my children are placed in cages. Yes. Mm. I, I, I can't do that. that. That would be 
either hypocritical of me or hypocritical of them. Mm -hmm. I could only go to a church that literally is at the borders with me fighting for my people. If the church can't do that, don't even bother calling me to be a leader. I, I'm not interested. Just as a follow up on, on that subject right there, um, Joseph Bark talks about um, uh, that racism needs to die. Like we just can't deal with it, but it completely has to die in the church before we can before we can, you know, remake the church, right? And he talks about these stages of grief that the church has to go through in order for that to happen. Where would you say the church is right now in a grief cycle? So we're going through the stages of grief. Where would you say we are <laughs> right well, now? I, I hesitate to say the Methodist church because I don't know where the Methodist church is. Yes. I do know that you're in a lot of trouble fighting over uh, the LGBTQI issue. Right. And, and as I mentioned earlier today, um, you can't say you want to be inclusive of African Americans and Latinx as long as they're heterosexual. <laughs> you, you can't do that. That you know, it, I, I'm sorry, because once you have permission to dis, to di, to disrespect mm -hmm. and dis and, and 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 dehumanize one group of people, yes, you have permission to do it to other groups of people. Intersectionality matters. Exactly. Mm -hmm. For my, for me to be accepted in your church, you have to ac accept my queer siblings. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a prerequisite. If the Methodist Church can't figure this out, yeah. it's doomed. And I'm speaking as an outsider. Mm -hmm. An outsider with an SBC background, no less. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's just talk about the background here. So you yeah. ready for you? Yeah. <laughs> We're getting into about twenty minutes left, and I want to make sure that Khalid, you have a time to answer your questions, and then we can go back to the um, to the chat. So, do you have anything? Any other your own personal questions, Khalid, you'd like to ask of oh, Dr. De La Torre? Well, you know, Dr. De La Torre, I, I I can you know continue to delve even deeper into the, the subject matters and. Um, I really enjoyed um, a, a talk that you gave in another context with uh, some Methodist, uh, our uh, Commission on Religion and Race, I believe it was, or um, where you talked about, and, and this hit my heart um, because it's 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 close to me in terms of the church's uh, need to, for, for for repentance, basically, mm. and the church's need to, um, in order to really. Um, redefine how the church uh, can live into its future. It future. needs to kind of tear down everything that it knows and, and really let go of ourselves in order to be rebuilt in Christ once again. Uh, will you talk a little bit about that again? Yeah. Um, the whole Christian um, understanding, I mean, if, if, we, if we really want to get theological here. Mm -hmm. the, the whole underlying of Christianity is dying to oneself, mm. nailing mm -hmm. one's sins to the cross, and becoming a new creature in Christ. I mean, that's the bottom formula. I don't care what denomination you belong to. We all can agree that's the foundation of Christianity. But all too often what we have done, I think, is that we have said we die to our sins and we nail them to the cross. Sins being defined again, our hyper-individuality, as those things that I do. Yes. I lied. I had evil thoughts. Um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I had, I lusted in my heart. Mm -hmm. You know, all these horrible sins, I have to repent from them, nail them to the cross so I could become new in Christ. This is so eurocentric, so hyper-individual. We need to understand sins no longer as something personal, but as something institutional, mm. or as something communal. Mm -hmm. So more, I mean, I, I don't think the Bible is really that interested in the personal piety of an individual. I really think that the Bible is interested in the mm -hmm. social structural sins of, you know, that, that, that prevent people from living life and life abundantly. Mm. I have to nail my racism, my classism, mm. my homophobia, 
my, my, my sexism, uh, my speciesism. I have to nail all that to the cross so then I could become a new person in Christ. Mm. And until I do that, I may be, my personal piety may be off the charts. I may be, you know, I'm, I may not lie and curse and, 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 and have evil thoughts. But, you know, like, you know, as Jesus said, I'm on that right road to hell because God never knew me. Because, because you're still supporting you. Is it because you're still supporting those institutions that uphold um, all the isms? Absolutely, because I'm complicit with them. Yes, okay. I continue, you know, and, and let's be honest with you, I'm still complicit with them. I mean, obviously, I don't have to be a sexist. The culture is sexist for me and will mm -hmm. be make sure I get paid mm -hmm. more than a woman, period. So mm -hmm. I don't have to be sexist. Mm. So it goes beyond just belief. Not yeah. only must I nail my sexism to the cross, but when I become a new creature, I must use my male privilege to dismantle the mm -hmm. very sexism yes. that is designed to benefit me. Yes. Because if there is no praxis, there is no faith. Mm. So it is, that's a word. So what I hear you saying, Dr. De La Torre, is that it, 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 I think that the example recently that I'm hearing from people is, it's not enough for me to say I'm not racist, I must be actively anti-racist. Absolutely. I think, one of the, I think one of the mistakes that US-centered Christianity does is to reduce faith to a belief. Yes. If I just believe in Jesus, yes. everything's okay. But as James reminds us, even the demons believe and tremble at his name. Mm -hmm. The belief really is, you know, you know, Satan believes. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah, really. Belief is not that important. Show me your faith through your praxis. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that I say I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a feminist and I'm anti-sexist and, you know, I march in the streets, you know, go sisters and all. That means nothing unless I am actively involved in overturning the tables of sexism and the mm -hmm. tables of racism. Because until that happens, it's not, you know, I, I'm not a Christian. I'm just, you know have a have membership in the country club someplace that you know everybody kind of like gets along and looks alike so would so. you agree that in order for us to um, hit all the areas of oppression right and all these isms that it has to start with race what is where do we start quite frankly i would argue we start with um with sexism sexism and mm. here's why yeah the idea of sexism if, is, is me as the male dominating the woman. In other words, it's an issue of domination. And in the same way that I dominate the woman, I also dominate other men and women of other races and ethnicities. So, so <laughs> my, my argument is, number one, you know, as sexism, racism, classism, um, heterosexism, um, all of the species, all of that is interconnected. It, it's mm -hmm. the same power structures mm -hmm. manifested as a form of domination. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the first form of domination was with women. You know, if, if you want to look at the biblical text, it yeah. began mm -hmm. with, you know, um, you shall submit to your husband and he will rule over you. And I think that becomes the model for mm -hmm. all forms of oppression. Oppression. Right. Yeah, and, and to speak to another form of oppression that we really haven't touched on, um, that is uh, obvi obviously a part of uh, our culture and is that of disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, those who are marginalized in scripture um, are often the the sick, the ill, the outside, yes. right? right? And, mm -hmm. And, and we, in many ways in the church, still continue to marginalize those with disabilities. Um, can you speak a little bit about disability liberation theology? Absolutely. 
I, and, you know, and, and that's a good point because one of the things about the scripture is that when you have somebody with a disability, they get healed by Jesus. Right. So the answer to disability is healing. And what happens when healing does not happen? And mm -hmm. secondly, mm -hmm. what happens when healing is not what's needed? Because we think that just because you're blind, you want to see. Mm -hmm. But what happens if instead that is the very nature, the, the very yeah. foundation of one's identity. How dare us impose upon them mm -hmm. um, what we think a healed, yeah. able body should be. Yeah. So, so, so there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, unfortunately there's not enough work yet done on uh, disability liberation theology. There's a few works out there which are now beginning to explore this in, in, in greater detail. And one of the things that I've learned from all this is that when we talk about um, disability, quite frankly, um, as I'm reminded by my colleague, uh, we are all just uh, momentarily able. Yeah, Dr. Yang talks about that a lot. Yeah, yeah. temporarily so, so able. Yeah, we're just temporarily able. So yeah. <laughs> this is a this is something that we are all going to eventually be part of this group. So the question then becomes, how do we instead of waiting? to have our aha moment, how do we have it now? Mm -hmm. And of course the church could do minor things like you know, make accessibility and, and that type of stuff. But I think we need to go further into actually hearing the voices of the disabled and what they want. Mm. Instead of what we, yeah. our able body, think that they want based on what, you know, on, on our perfection of being able. So excellent, thank you, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let us go back to some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, I've been asking the questions out of the chat. Uh, so okay. those questions are definitely being uh, handled. Um, <laughs> so someone also uh, writes, um, I work with persons in the community that are disabled. Oh, hold on, sorry, just did that one. I heard you say uh, how your ideas and understanding has grown tremendously since writing the book. When I read your book, I was surprised when you mentioned that while living in Miami, you were in a dominant culture and thus uh, benefited from racism. However, when you left Miami, you were a victim of racism. Connecting the idea that it was more about social structure than racism itself. Uh, I'm curious to know if, if, if you could speak on um, if your ideas have, uh, or the concept has evolved since that time. Yeah. Um, it I still agree with that. I still believe in that in that particular opposite, but I do think it has gone a little bit deeper in where, as we know, race is really a construct more than anything else. And I say that because in my homeland, I'm a light-skinned Latino, mm -hmm. which means I'm the one that's the oppressor. I'm the one that the society is designed to privilege and benefit. Understood. What happened in Miami <laughs> is that we created a replica of our homeland and we brought our own biases and prejudices mm -hmm. with us in the creation of this new homeland in exile that replicated though, you know, that racism. So in Miami, I was absolutely the racist. You no know, question about it. If a cop stopped me, they were probably a fellow Latino. So I had nothing to worry about. <laughs> but when I moved to Kentucky mm -hmm. and, you know, and I couldn't get a job uh, because I, you know, and, and I was made fun of and, and you know, and, 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 and I, I felt, and I, you know, and, and being stopped by the cop was a much scarier situation. That's when I began to learn that one can be part of an oppressive group in one locale and part of the oppressive group in another locale. You know, depending on, 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 on orientation, on race, on, on, on skin pigmentation. I mean, colorism within communities of color mm -hmm. um, is it, also, as we know, a major thing, uh, depending on, 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 the, on the darkness of one's hue. Uh, it can be brutal. Yeah. yeah so so, so it's it, rather than looking at this as oppress and oppressor, there is a spectrum in where depending on where I am, 
at any given time, yes. you know, I, I, I could face extreme danger or extreme privileges. And, and it's not just because I have a lighter skin pigmentation. I mean, I, I'm sure no one, you know, if, if you're white, you probably could care less if Colin Powell buys a house next to you. Mm -hmm. Because he has a a a a a, um, a, a cultural capital mm -hmm. that allows him cultural capital, yeah, that That's allows great. him to be able to, to to live next to you. But you probably will be very upset if a janitor who is you know who is black moves in next to you. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not just black white; it's also Black with economic privilege and 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 uh, and, and capital, yeah. or black and poor. So yeah, I, I think that um, I, I'm I'm wrestling now more with with the nuances of how this plays out. Yeah, we always I think talk about power structures, right, and mm -hmm. uh, how that racism paired or, or that discrimination paired with power then becomes the racism. Um, and, and so when, when we think about who is in power, mm -hmm. then th those dynamics definitely are more fluid. Mm -hmm. And they're more fluid, but also we need to begin maybe looking at power as being everywhere. Mm -hmm. In where even the oppressed can, um, can manipulate power. Yeah. I mean, that's what we see in the protest movement, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, so, so power becomes more of something that is everywhere. And then the question is, how do we learn to use it to undo the hierarchy mm. to which power is usually attached to? That's good, yeah. We do have our own caste system. I'm hearing more and more <laughs> discussions about caste mm -hmm. um, here mm -hmm. in the United States. In fact, there's a new book uh, uh, on uh, social anthropology about caste in Western civilization. But uh, it's an interesting time. Javier, did you have another question? Um, I don't, yes, thank you, Khalif. I don't remember that, Dr. Latore, if it was on chapter three or four, um, there was some mention about um, the, the Latinos and um, and, and it's interesting to see the dynamics. Maybe this has to do with you were, what you were talking. Um, I remember, I don't know if you remember when uh, the caravans were coming from uh, Central America. And so at that time there was uh, many, you know, passing through Mexico and uh, there, you know, crisis and, and challenges began to, to arise. And there was one um, incident where um, and I don't know how much, you know, it was, you know, the media uh, um, inventing this or putting it, you know, inflating it more uh, about a lady from Honduras uh, or, um, and, and uh, that she rejected some beans that, you know, the, the, the Mexicans uh, gave her. And so all this through social media was, was against this, this, this woman from Honduras uh, that she didn't want the, the beans and how, uh, you know, how, how delicate she was. And, and so you begin to see a, uh, here a dynamic of, um, of, I don't know, I don't know if the word classism is, is the correct one, but you know, this, this bias against each other and, and those in the margins are fighting against each other. And is there, is there some, some liberation or some reconciliation that this can come to because uh, you know I, I I see that uh, at times as well when I when I go you know back to Mexico to visit and how there's you know you, you know prejudice or biases against others and right. so uh, yeah uh, two 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 things on that first of all absolutely within communities of color, we also do horrible things to each other. And, and, and that goes without saying. Mm -hmm. uh, we could be, you know, there are Latinx who are light-skinned like myself who are very racist. 
there's African Americans who are very xenophobic. Um, you know, so, so, so we have our own problems that we also have to deal with. So it's not just, you know, white people are evil and people of color are good. We all fall short of the glory of God mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we all have to wrestle with things like yeah. this. Saying that, I'm sure we've all heard the, um, the analogy of the crabs in the buckets. Mm -hmm. That um, if you go crabbing and you put all the crabs in the bucket, you don't have to worry about anybody escaping because the ones in the bottom pull the crabs trying to escape back into the bucket. They use that oh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's that a very metaphor. common analogy. But what we usually forget is that in their natural habitat, when the waves are crashing against the rocks, they're pulling each other up mm. onto the rocks. The whole idea of the bucket is an artificial construct that these um, crabs were never intended to be in. <laughs> mm. And in a way, I wow. think what happens is all of us are in that bucket, in this, in this white bucket of, of colonialism that mm. we're intended to be in, so we behave in ways that are self-destructive. Mm. So the the natural, birds in our natural habitat that, that destroys them. Yeah, the birds in our natural habitat, and maybe we might behave differently, and may, we might behave better. Now, I'm not saying that you know we're perfect in any way. I'm just saying that part of the problem of why we're at each other's throats is because we have believed in the concept of zero sum rule. Yes, and if African Americans. Are, are, are advancing, it's a, they're advancing at the expense of Latinx. Yeah. We gotta stop them. Mm -hmm. Ignoring mm -hmm. that we're just replicating being in this false construct of a white bucket. Scarcity mm -hmm. mentality. Yeah, it is a scarcity mentality. There's not enough to go around. So I'm, I'm not excusing our own problems within our own communities, but I am saying that what's aggravating that is that we are being placed in a bucket that's artificial and, and destructive. Hmm. Man, we could go for, you know, hours, uh, Dr. Dillator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, uh, it's been such an, uh, a powerful and meaningful Hi. conversation, um, at least from my perspective. Uh, I think the folks out there have really uh, and are really appreciating it as well. Um, we are getting close to the time, Kimberly. If um, if we have one, you know, time for one more question, I think. I like the one that's at the bottom there. Um, and I can read in the chat. I can read it if you want to. Um, what would we say to multiracial ethnic children that feel tension between their heritage and other than calling them Bridges, is it better? Is it there a better language to help identify? Their, is there a better language to help identify their struggle? So yeah. how do we help? Yeah. I don't know because I don't have children that are in, interracial or, mm -hmm. or, or different ethnicity. Um, my wife is also of the same ethnicity that I am. So uh, you know, so, so, so it's a question that I'm, I'm I'm not equipped to answer. But let me at least say this: the the, the language of bridges is problematic. Mm -hmm. because a bridge is something that connects this over here with that this over here. over here. Yeah. And somehow the bridge connects these two, when in reality, these two things are already together. Yeah. You don't need a bridge because they're already interconnected. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, again, not my area of expertise, but I would imagine, I would guess that we just need to learn how to sell, if we could learn how to celebrate everyone's difference, mm -hmm. whatever that difference is, then this should not be a concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I just had one last question um, that I wanted to ask and, you know, and maybe we've already answered it, but, but, but what does the church have to gain by really intentionally investing in reading the Bible from the margins and, and just carrying that through our theology? The salvation. Yeah. Basically, the salvation. Salvation, yeah. Yeah. Because the church that refuses, mm -hmm. the, the majority of the body of Christ is damned. Mm. 
Okay. Then salvation is literally at stake. Right. And so too all of our salvation. Right. <laughs> at stake. Yes. yes. Thank you for the boldness. Thank you. Thank we you. Are so thankful for this conversation. Um, if you guys have not gotten the book yet, you know, take the opportunity, go out there, get the book, read it, engage in, in more conversation. So if you're looking for resources, continue to engage with us in the DSC Race Coalition. Um, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us uh, on our website. Both of the links are in there in, in the chat group. We want to thank the Reverend Dr. Miguel de la Torre, one more time. Thank you for being with us tonight. And Happy we really appreciate you being here. Yeah. Gracias. Mm -hmm.